So, I'm going to be presenting a paper that we published last year in Nature Methods. And in it, we showed that we could predict epigenomic modifications from DNA motifs. And the purpose here isn't necessarily to have a method where we go and predict epigenomic modifications from motifs, but it was to show that there are regulatory relationships between DNA motifs, cis regulatory elements, and the epigenome. And we chose to use prediction rather than correlation, as it's a more robust indicator of this. And we wanted to look at DNA motifs, because they present specific cis regulatory elements, which we could potentially edit and then allow things like epigenomic knockouts, where you remove a modification from a loci. Whereas things like GC content, which are associated with specific regions of epigenomic modification, those are less manipulatable for such techniques. So to give some background, the human epigenome is a series of covalent modifications to chromatin. These mark regions of the genome as active, like active promoters or transcribed, and they can mark other parts of the genome as repressed. And this is really important in multicellular organisms, where we have all these different cell types, and all of them have different properties and different patterns of cell type specific gene expression. So there's a big sort of uh, issue in what I'm saying, in that I've just said that every cell type has its own epigenome, but every cell type has the same genome. How can the static genome lead and regulate a dynamic epigenome? And this can make sense when you think about gene regulation and gene expression, because each cell type has its own specific pattern of gene expression. Uh, and these are specific gene regulate, well, the spell, cell type specific patterns of gene expression uh, have different levels of transcription factors and chromatin modifying enzymes. So this leads to different interactions with the DNA and the recruitment of different enzymes to different loci. Thus, you can have this cell type specific epigenomic modification which is guided by the underlying DNA sequence. So in this study, what we wanted to do was go into different epigenomes and identify the regions which have a specific modification and then look for regulatory elements, DNA motifs, which are overrepresented there. And we want to do this with different modifications and do it genome-wide, and then build up this catalog of associations and do it over different cell types. And as you build up this catalog of cis regulatory elements and modifications of different cell types, you can start learning about their specificities. Are certain motifs always associated with specific modifications or only in certain cell types? And start understanding the underlying cis regulatory code. So to do this study, we used this data set, which we uh, published in Cell in 2013, which was part of the Roadmap Epigenomics Project. It was produced at Bing Red Center, and it features uh, H1 embryonic stem cells and four derived lineages. And we have six different histone modifications, each represent different aspects of the epigenome and have different properties. So this is the sort of analysis scheme that I use to do the work. It's an analysis pipeline called Epigram, which I came up with. And at the core of it, you, you start with two sets of regions. You have your regions, which you think have a modification, peaks, which you've called. And then you have a background region, set of regions, regions which don't have your modification. Uh, but in particular, I make sure that the background is mappable so that I know that it's not just a lack of mappability in the area giving rise to a lack of signal. And this is quite challenging from a sequence analysis point of view because you have many, many regions and they can be variable in length and can be very long. But, so I took all these, my foreground and background regions and the first thing I did was balance them. And I balanced them for length distribution and GC content distribution. And this is quite a critical step if you really want to predict the epigenome from DNA motifs. The reason for that is that Regions like H, m m epigenomic modifications, such as H3K4 trimethylation, is often associated with regions of high GC content. And you can just like do a simple Bayesian classifier based on GC content, achieve an AUC of about 0.7 if you take an unbalanced set. And I didn't want to be predicting purely on the basis of GC content, because that's not cis regulatory elements that I'm interested in. I wanted to be going down it just to motifs and looking at their predictive power. So we, we balance both our foreground and background so they have the same distribution of GC content. Um, so then I, in, in both sets of sequences, I performed DNA motif discovery. 
using two programs, Chris Glass's Homer, well, Chris Brenner's as well, and uh, my, own, my own method, which I wrote, and it's in the paper. Um, an important aspect here, which is really annoying from a computational point of view, is that I have to perform my motif discovery only in my training data, because the motif discovery is part of the training of the model. You're creating the features and it would bias things to do it on the data set overall. So therefore, I have to do it in each of the folds of my cross-validation, as well as on the overall data set to get my final set of motifs. So then, I, to, I've got all these motifs, and I want to try and reduce it to like an, an interpretable model. So I perform feature selection. And I have two rounds of this. Initially, I use a logistic regression, which gives me my complete model. And then I boil this down even further to like a, a small subset of motifs, which are most informative. Uh, Right. And then the motifs are used, uh, well, they're, scored, they're scanned against the sequences, and their scores are used in a, as features in a predictive model, which, and I use a random forest classifier, and then I you know, uh, make predictions in the five-fold cross-validation. And then the final output is a prediction accuracy and a set of motifs which are identified on the overall data set. So in my first comparison, what I did was I took regions which have a specific epigenomic modification. And I compared them to regions of the genome which had no specific modification, but they were mappable. So at least I knew that it wasn't just mapping issues. Uh, and so the complete line here uh, is my full model accuracy, and the dotted line is my reduced model accuracy. And these bar shots show the number of motifs. Uh, and the top line is the complete model, and the smaller line is the reduced model. And you can see that you can really reduce the number of motifs down to about 20, 30, 40 or something, while making most of the prediction accuracy of the full model. Uh, and this is fairly consistent. So this is the H1 cells uh, results, but here I've shown the results across the other cell types. And the uh, prediction performance is fairly consistent for the modifications. Uh, overall, we get like an average AUC of 0.84. And the best performing mark is H3K4 trimethylation, which is that found at promoters, and if you've ever done much chip deep data analysis, you'll know that H3K4 trimethylation has these lovely, tightly punctuated peaks. It's not so surprising that maybe its placement is more tightly regulated than the modifications, and therefore it may do better in this analysis. But there's a big caveat in my last piece of analysis. In that I, I'm comparing regions which have a modification to regions that don't have any nucleosomes, well, have any modifications. And I could just be comparing regions with nucleosomes to regions without nucleosomes. And I'm not really predicting epigenetic modification. I'm predicting nucleosome placement or something. And well, that's an interesting question, which has been studied a lot. It's not what I'm aiming for, and it's not what I'm trying to learn. So then what I did secondly was I compared regions which have a specific modification to regions that have another modification, but not the modification I'm going to try and predict. And here are the results for that. And uh, overall, we get the same average AUC. Uh, and uh, you get the same sort of trends with motifs being reduced a lot in the re reduced model compared to the full. And you still get consistently with the AUCs, really. Uh, so another potential issue with uh, the analysis I've shown is that modifications are found in typical regions. h 3 k 4 trimethylation is typically found at promoters. We all know it marked promoters. So I could just be comparing promoters to non-promoters. And promoters are just generally enriched for motifs. There's lots of motifs there. So all I could be doing is finding motifs which are at promoters and absent in the rest of the genome, and I'm not really predicting epigenomic modification. So what I did here was I created a background which is made up of regions which typically possess a modification but is absent in that cell type. And again, our results are pretty consistent. Uh, our AUC only dropped by a, a hundred, and uh, like H3K4 trimethylation is still performing the best, and our results are fairly uh, consistent across different cell types. So I identified all these motifs, lots of motifs in the different cell types uh, for the different modifications, and we wanted to try and make sense of all of it. And this is a very busy figure that you're not going to be able to interpret fully while I'm speaking. Uh, but what we did was to try and interpret them, we clustered the motifs by specificities, where we found them predictive. And we did this separately for the modification specificity and the cell type specificity. 
Um, so this group here represents motifs which are found exclusively in H3K4 trimethylation. Uh, and this set here represents motifs which are found exclusively in mesenderderm. And the arrows are just to uh, highlight some examples. For example, uh, GATA6 was found exclusively in mesoendoderm at H3K27 acetylation. And, and this sort of reflects what's known about the developmental biology of these cell types. And, and just to show that further, I, I show the gene expression profiles of the motifs, of, of factors which represent the motifs, alongside their interplay of H3K4 trimethylation here. And you can see there's a quite a bit of mirroring in the two patterns. So next we wanted to do is try and use all this information to try and understand about the regulation of the epigenome. Can we see any mechanistic insights? And the simple thing that we tried was seeing if there's any location preference within peaks. Are they always randomly distributed along the peaks, or are they particularly enriched? Uh, oh, are they particularly enriched at the centre of the peaks or at the edge of the peaks? Uh, and this clustering shows the results here. Uh, when you get a red light red showing up here. It means it's particularly enriched in the center. Uh, these guys are kind of neutral with no preference. And then there's a sort of smaller set of motifs which have a sort of edge effect. And the central motifs, you could hypothesize maybe these guys bind at the center of the region, open up the chromatin recruitment, chromatin modifying enzymes. And the edge motifs, perhaps they're binding somewhere, forming a boundary and helping to stop the chromatin modification spreading any further. Uh, so this is one example of uh, an edge motif we found. Uh, with H3K4 trimethylation, and it looks a bit like these nuclear receptor motifs, so it's not a perfect match. But if we draw the profile of this uh, motif and another one alongside the profiles of H3K4 trimethylation at transcription start sites, you'll see there's this kind of relationship between the two, with this motif sort of being enriched on the outside of the uh, H3K4 trimethylation enriched regions. And this motif sort of kind of mirroring uh, the signal with perhaps like a sort of peak around the region where H3K4 trimethylation is depleted at where the, uh, in the, you know, the TSS. But being identified all these motifs, I still haven't really, and I've done prediction, but it, it could still be nonsense. I might, they may just be associated and not regulatory. And we wanted to try and look into this. Is there really a regulatory relationship between these motifs and the epigenome, or are they just associated through some unknown relationship? And so we, we came up with this scheme to try and look at this. Um, so if you have the same cell type's epigenome for multiple individuals and their genome sequence, you can look at situations like this, where, where in the same region of the genome, you, you have a peak in multiple individuals, but it's absent in the other. Then you can look into the genotypes there and you can try and find situations like this, where you've got your motif, and there's a correlation between it being disruptive and the uh, modification being depleted. Uh, so fortunately for us, uh, Mike Snyder's group released a data set of 19 uh, individuals, the same uh, F genome, I think it's a lymphoblastoid cell. And they actually uh, correlated changes in the motifs with uh, H3K4 trimethylation and H3K27 acetylation uh, levels. So they had these 32,000 regions of H3K27 acetylation. And they found using 662 no motifs that 32% of the regions had some significant correlation with them. And they had this figure where they had 4,500 regions correlating 20, 000, or 20 motifs. So what I did was took their H3K27 acetylation peaks, a Ryan epigram created as motifs, and then repeated the analysis. So using 133 motifs for the epigram's full model, I found that I could get significant correlation with 62% of the regions, which is a big jump from the 32% uh, using considerably less motifs. And if I took my 20 motif model, which is the same size number as they put in their figure, then I get over 7,000 regions um, uh, using 20 motifs. So this is no criticism of Mike Snyder's paper. It, they were just using no motifs. My point is that if you look, use epigram search for specific motifs which uh, are related to the epigenomic modification, then you'll find things which are not in the known motif sets, but are, well, are involved in its regulation. 
having done this genome-wide uh, validation, we wanted to take it further and go into some specific sites and really do a controlled examination of what's going on. So we, we found two sites, and we, we identified, these are enhancers, by the way, uh, and we identified the, the epigram motifs within them. And presumably, this is what's sort of going on. You've got them, these motifs, and they're being bound by TFs or other sequence-specific binding factors, and recruiting cells to tell transferase. Uh, so what we did was we used genome editing, and we cut out, uh, we made cuts on the side of this region, and we replaced it with the same sequence, but with the motif scrambled. Uh, yeah, and then we followed this up with chip PCR to look at HRK training and acetylation levels. And here's the results. So you, you can see this is a wild type. And this is an armo sh motif shuffled. And there's a clear drop in HRK27 acetylation on these two different uh, PCR probes, which are here and here. And we, we did the same thing on a second uh, site, and we got the same result. So, in summary, uh, I've shown you that we can like, quantitatively model the relationship between DNA motifs and the epigenome, and use these to make predictions about the placement of epigenomic modifications. I've used them to like, understand the mechanism behind the placement of epigenomic modifications, and I've shown you validation, which shows that the well, causative links between these motifs being disrupted and epigenomic modification levels. And this little figure sort of shows my idea for uh, how cell type specific states are maintained by interplay between human regulatory networks uh, driving cell type specific epigenomic modification leading to cell type specific patterns of gene expression. So you get this sort of loop of reinforcement. So my acknowledgements are to UCSD and one group and uh, the Epigenomic Center uh, Roadmap Project in Bing Ren, uh, where I did all this work, and then to my new employee, Janssen uh, and Jonathan Johnson, who uh, paid for me to come here today and have uh, given me this quite enjoyable job actually identified in the industry where I still get to do this awesome integrative genomic stuff. And we are hiring if anyone's interested. Uh, and that's everything. Thank you for listening. Questions for John. Uh, first of all, it's really impressive to see how a sequence level defines the global state of the cell service. Uh, really makes a strong argument for many people are doing, trying to search for different motifs and different tissues and so on. But um, the question is how many of the motifs you find in NOVA are actually novel, or they are just variants of known motifs with some small changes which are help you to differentiate different uh, types of uh, tissues. Mm. And uh, a similar question is, why you say it's gator 6 and not gator 2? And how do you discriminate uh, transcription factors within the families? Of course, you can do it with expression data, but you say it's concordant with expression data. So what's, do you use it or do you check it? Or what, what's the first or second? Thank so, you. So um, I have to admit, you know, you, you find the gator motif purely from the teeth, there's no way of knowing that I know of. Maybe if you went for cofactors. So what I did was I looked in the literature and gene expression there. I, I didn't work that out purely from the motif, I have to admit. Uh, and your first question, how many are novel? I mean, how many are subtle variants? And that's hard. You know, you can cluster them, and then you take a cutoff, and where is that cutoff? And you know, I, I'm not really sure. It's really hard to know because it's a continuum, right? And you'd need a way of really trying to test and seeing. And I, I don't have a good answer for that, I'm sorry. and I can ask another question. Um, so you showed how your performance was on different cell types right, in this one data set, and there is a pretty big drop off, right, from the embryonic stem cells to some other further differentiated cell lines, if I remember that. Uh, I don't and think the drop offs are big, I can't. And so, um, either way, the, um, how, how good is this for a specific cell type, specific size? So if you only evaluate it on the highly specific sites, are you able to predict this? Or would you then, for instance, just pull out essentially the known cell type specific transcription factors that will bind in the vicinity of cell type specific answers? Yeah, so in the paper, I left it out actually, for the sake of time and making things clear. What I did, I identified regions with a modification in one cell type, and then which were absent in another cell type, and compared them to vice versa. And then you do get a much bigger drop in performance. 
uh, because, as you say, you're really only getting at the self-specific regulators and any kind of general regulators of chromatin which aren't cell type specific, any prediction performance coming from them reduces. Uh, I think the average AUC may have gone down to maybe like 0.75 from like 0.84, but it, it's in the paper and I, I yeah, I'm, that's my best answer I can do from my memory. <laughs> But if there are no further questions, we should also wrap up so that we all...